We're in Luke 5, verses 12 through 16, that was just read for us. And it's interesting, as we think about Luke up until this point, um, we've been working through Luke, and Pastor Ken was, was walking us through there. And the last passage that we discussed, we see Simon Peter falling down at Jesus' feet and saying, depart from me, God, I am a sinful man. And then in this passage, we see this cleansing of a leper. And in the next passage, we'll see, see this healing of a, a paralytic man, a paralyzed man. And this whole passage is going to kind of culminate towards the end of chapter 5 when Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's why we're here today. We're sinners in need of a Savior. And in in this passage specifically, we see one of these sick people, a leper. And it's interesting to see this account specifically because Luke, the author of this gospel, he's, remember he's writing these things he said at the beginning of Luke to, to give certainty to a man by the name of Theophilus, and he's writing these things as a physician, so he's a doctor. And often he gives special care and attention to those who were dealing with a sickness. And here he's sharing this encounter of Jesus with a leper. Now, you may or may not know what leprosy is, Leprosy was a death sentence. Leprosy was primarily a skin disease where your body would be covered in wounds. And it was in the late 1800s that there was a man named Hansen, and he fit all the criteria for this disease of leprosy, and it's been called Hansen's disease. It was a disease that was believed to be present back in ancient times, far back in, in fact, now with what we can do in the miracles of modern medicine and understanding, they've excavated old uh, tombs of, of uh, uh, pharaohs who they discovered remnants of this bacteria dating all the way back to ancient Egypt. Leprosy has been around for a long time. So Jesus is walking one day and he encounters what would have been the most, one of the most chilling sights to see in Bible times, a man covered in leprosy. Could you imagine encountering a leper, a person who was covered from head to toe in open sores? It looked white. They were contagious, they were sick, they were dying. Perhaps this leper, as he came near Jesus, as he he was told to do, we we don't know that he did so here, but he did in many accounts, uh, lepers would be tasked with crying out unclean. You, You couldn't go near anybody. The fear would typically grip somebody. I couldn't think of a more fearful thing during this time than being touched by a leper. That disease that culminates in a painful death being spread to you. Consider what it would mean just for a second for your friend or your spouse or your child to have leprosy. Lepers would be outcast from society. You would be sent far away to dwell in colonies. You'd be separated from family and loved ones. You'd never feel the hug of a person again. Your body being ravaged by sickness, forever yelling unclean in the presence of everyone. One man described leprosy as a living death. That was the reality of this condition. Perhaps there would be no more fearful or chilling words to hear during this time than when you think, maybe I have it, and you go before the priest and he says, you're unclean. You have leprosy. 
And on top of all that, just the pain that goes with having this sickness, typically people saw leprosy as, or a, a leprous person as somebody who received judgment from God. So if you think about some of the old Bible stories, you think about Miriam, Moses' sister, I'm not sure if you remember that, but in, in Numbers 12, it shares that story. And she had spoken out against uh, Moses for marrying a Cushite woman. And her and Aaron had both kind of rebelled against Moses' leadership. And so they're speaking out against him. And God says, you know, it's there where it says Moses was the most meek man in all of Israel. He's very, seemed to be a humble guy. And he wasn't even really taking up for himself. We don't get the sense. But God decides to take up for his servant Moses and strikes Moses' sister Miriam with leprosy. She's sent outside the camp. She was ultimately healed in part by Moses' own asking, will you please forgive and help my sister? So it was a result of Miriam's sin that she received leprosy. Gehazi was another one. I'm just testing your Bible trivia today, right? I'm sure many of you guys were thinking about Gehazi on your way in. And Gehazi was Elisha's servant. And if you remember the story, there was Elisha, there was Naaman, and there was Gehazi. And Naaman was healed of leprosy by Elisha. So Naaman had went to Elisha for leprosy and uh, dealing with leprosy and, and Elisha said, Naaman, go dip in the Jordan seven times and it's kind of dirty, didn't want to do that, but Naaman had leprosy, so he was willing to give it a try and so he does and when he comes out the seventh time, he's clean. The leprosy's gone. And so he says, Elisha, let me pay you. Elisha says, I'm good. I don't need it. Well, when Naaman leaves, Gehazi, Elisha's servant, starts thinking, that guy was willing to pay. What if I just run down, get his attention, maybe he'll give me the money. Elisha is good, so he doesn't need it. I'll just hold on to this. So Gehazi does that, and when Gehazi gets back to the house, Elisha's waiting there, saying, Gehazi, where were you? Where'd you go? And, uh, nowhere is what he responds and go anyway just you know running errands taking the camel into the shop whatever and he comes back and Gehazi was struck with leprosy as a result of his kind of underhanded ways there he had it until he died Uzziah was the third one he was the king of Israel that story is in 2 Chronicles 26 and Uzziah was lifted up with with pride and he grew strong. And so he said, I am going to not just be the physical leader of Israel, but I'm going to be the spiritual leader of Israel. So he goes into the, te- into the temple and he says, I'm going to sacrifice. There was a guy, Azariah, who has recently become one of my Bible characters that I'm just amazed by. Azariah stood up. He was a priest. He stood up with 80 priests behind him and said, no, And he withstood this strong king, one of the most powerful kings of that day. Uzziah said, I'm not listening to Azariah. And so he goes to sacrifice anyway. God struck him with leprosy and he had it until he died. And so because of these examples of people being struck with leprosy as a result of their sin, now they're destined to live not only just with the physical ailments of it, but you probably did something to give yourself leprosy. It was probably a result of your own Sin was the the belief. And so now you're dealing with shame and pain and rejection and suffering. This is the state of a leprous person. And we don't know much about this leper. This story is recorded in Matthew 8, Mark 1, and here. We don't know his name. We don't know the location he was found in. We don't have many specifics at this point. But we do know that he was facing this death sentence. And it's here as he's walking in the city, which is something he really probably shouldn't have been doing anyway. He encounters Jesus. Many people have saw leprosy as a a parable for sin in the Christian's life. Um, and, And there's discussion as to whether or not that's appropriate. But there's a lot of connections between leprosy and what we know about that and sin. So an example would be, um, in Isaiah 1.6, it, it talks about how the, the nation of Israel was sick from the, the, the tip of its head to the foot down below. It, the whole body was impacted by sin. Well, leprosy 
runs from the soles of your feet to the crown of your head, you become wholly unclean. So sin impacts the whole body. Sin makes you unclean like leprosy. Luke, or, uh, Leviticus 13 and 14 talks about everything that went into the idea of leprosy. If, if your desire is to read some ceremonial laws on leprosy, Leviticus 13 and 14 is the place to go. You can get all of an understanding of the ceremony surrounding it. But basically, the person suspected of leprosy was to show themselves to the priest. If they're considered to have leprosy, Leviticus 13.3 says that you'd be then deemed unclean. So just as a leper would be considered unclean, so people who have sin in their lives are, are unclean. They're need, in need of cleansing. Isaiah 64.6 says we've all become like one who's unclean. All our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So sin impacts the whole body like leprosy. It makes you unclean like leprosy. It requires atonement like leprosy. When the person was then uh, rid of this leprosy, they had to go to the priest and there was multiple things that would happen, but one of them would be that the, the priest would offer sacrifices for this leper. So once the, the leper had been marked clean, the priest would offer sacrifices and would atone for this period of uncleanness. So sin requires atonement just like leprosy did. Sin, when it conceives, it brings forth death like leprosy. Leprosy was a death sentence and sin is a death sentence. James 1 says that when, you know, temptation brings about sin and when sin conceives, it brings forth death. Sinners like lepers were walking, were dead in our trespasses and sin. We're, we're the walking dead. But Christ, Right? One person said, leprosy is an outward and visible sign of the innermost spiritual corruption. And Kent Hughes says, the leper is a physical illustration of ourselves apart from the cleansing work of Christ. Sin has invaded all our, our faculties. So leprosy wasn't just given as a judgment for somebody who, was, uh, who deserved it, right? That's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is leprosy is, is similar. Being a leper is, is, is really being similar to somebody who's being who's uh, caught and dead in sin. There's a lot of similarities there. So now to the actual story, what does this leper do? While he was in one of the cities speaking of Jesus, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him. The first thing this leper does is he identifies Jesus. We know the leper was... In the city, he doesn't appear to be just wandering. He appears to be looking for something or someone. And when he sees Jesus, he responds as if he had been searching high and low for this man. He falls on his face before him. He identifies Jesus as the solution to his problem. This is so similar to us. Whatever we're wrestling through or going through today, can I assure you of this reality that Jesus is not your problem, but he is the solution. It can be easy to um, you know, find yourself believing that if you didn't have to worry about obeying laws, or following God, or growing, or controlling your anger, or whatever the thing may be, loving my spouse better, right? being gentle with my children, or grandchildren or whatever the case may be. If, if I didn't have to worry about those things, I wouldn't have problems. And God puts these things on me. But the reality is, is that Jesus is, is not our problem. Our, our own hearts are our problem. If we were all alone without people or company, there would still be problems because the problems come out of our own heart. And Jesus is the solution to that. And so, the leper identifies Jesus and then he, in humility, he falls on his face before him. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. 
the lepers approach, he identifies Jesus. He was humble in falling on his face before Jesus. And he was submissive. You see the, the response of the leper, or the initial statement, he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. You know, he doesn't, this leper doesn't make demands. He doesn't try to hold Jesus accountable for what he need to or what he needs to or what he must do. In humble submission, he says, God, whatever you deem best. If you will, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And what, what a posture for us. We would go to God. We, we, you know, we, we were talking today in Sunday school about the illusion of feeling like we have control over a situation or circumstances in our life. Reality is, is we don't. Certain things may give us this illusion like we have control or like we know what we, what we can and can't do and can and can't accomplish. But the reality is, is that we can't add a, an hour to our life if we want to. That it is all in God's control. And so we go to him, complete submission, God, if you will, if you desire. It's all about you. And the leper, he acknowledges that his filth, his own sickness is the problem. The leper saw that he needed to be rescued. He was not in a power position here. He needed God's help. And for us to see ourselves in any type of power position different than the leper would be an illusion because we are so many ways similar. The leper gives us a beautiful model of how do you go to God when you're wrestling with sin, when you're struggling with what to do and where to go, and how do you come to him? When you look to Jesus, you humble yourself before him in his word, you submit yourself to his plan, whatever you deem best, and you acknowledge your need. I'm in need of you, Jesus. And we'll see, spoiler alert, that the man does get healed, right? We've already read that a little bit. And, but he was, all, all signs points to, he was healed because he was desperate for Jesus. He was desperate for, for salvation. He was desperate to be saved. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, can I implore you to have that desperation? There is nothing of greater value, of greater beauty, of greater significance than to encounter Jesus. And so we see the leper's approach and then the Messiah's willingness to cleanse. This is, man, one of the most impactful things. And I I don't know if we can even fully grasp it if we were not in this scenario what this must have looked like. Verse 13, Jesus' first action. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. The leper with open sores and open wounds who has been outcast from society, left, uh, kicked out of what would have been his home and with his family and perhaps has never been touched by an individual in months or days or years Jesus, when encountering the leper and perhaps the the group around him were maybe stepping back away from this leper. I can imagine if a leper were to walk down the middle row, the people on the edges here would probably scooch away a little bit. I don't want to get any of this sickness. I'm not sure what's happening here. Right? We've we've done this uh, every over the last few years when you see somebody cough in public. You're uh, very aware of that, right? Because the spread of sickness and Whenever I, I cough in public or one of my children cough, I'm looking around like I need to kind of keep them away from everybody. But Jesus doesn't do that. He leans in and touches the leper. Do you realize the significance of him touching the leper? 
that Jesus touching the leper, it, first of all, it broke tradition. What would, it would have rendered Jesus unclean, right? Leviticus 5, you're not supposed to touch a leper. And Jesus did that. So he, he already broke, uh, it would, without being considered unclean. So he already broke that. Jesus touching the leper demonstrated that he had power over death and disease. Jesus was on a mission to die on the cross for our sins. And if he would have died before that, that would have been problematic. But Jesus knew he had absolute power over death and disease. He had no fear of what this leper and his sickness could bring to him. Jesus touching the leper, it would have ensured death, right? For any, any human, when you reach out and touch a leper, it's almost an assured death. But not for Jesus he had power over death and disease. Jesus touching the leper demonstrated that he has compassion on the outcasts, the weak, and the needy. Jesus could have said, this isn't worth my time right now. I'm, I'm kind of the savior of the world. This is a little bit of an inconvenience. I'm dealing with other things. In fact, it will result that there were some, some negative consequences of Jesus healing this man. But Jesus instead stooped down in compassion and love for the outcast, the unclean, and the needy. There was no sense of, of self-righteous from the only person who was in him self-righteous. There was no self-righteousness there. There was compassion. And later in this chapter, as I mentioned before, he'll say that he came for the sick. He came for the weak. He came for the needy. If, if you today are whole and, and you are in need of nothing, that's great. Jesus didn't come for you then. But if you are needy and fall short and fail, that's great. Because Jesus came for you. Jesus touching the leper Ultimately, in the bigger picture of everything, it demonstrated that the Messiah is here. The one who they had been waiting for has arrived. Jesus, throughout Luke, one of the things that we're gaining confidence is that Jesus is the one true Messiah. He is the one who will come to reverse death and disease. <coughs> I'm going to cough in public after saying that, so please don't ostracize me. Jesus, Jesus had, had come to reverse the curse, right? And, and I'd mentioned this one of the last times that I had preached. Sin and death had, had came and was spreading rampant throughout the world, but Jesus was showing that he is the Messiah who will one day make all things new, and he gives us a glimpse in it in this passage by healing a person who was going to die. See, Elisha, he had healed a, a leper, the prophet Elisha. Moses had done many miracles. But a greater than Moses and a greater than Elisha had come. That will be mentioned next week as Jesus also forgives sinners, which neither of them could do. Jesus was proving he was the Messiah that they had waited for. And you'll, you'll get a sense of that when the religious leaders shortly start to panic, start to get frustrated. That starts in verse 17. So Jesus touched him and Jesus cleansed him. I love Jesus' words here. Picture him saying them to me, honestly. Jesus stretched out his hand, he touched them. Right, the question was, will you, Jesus? I will. Be clean. You know, the willing, we talk about all the different characteristics of Jesus, and there's so many to talk about. Here, the willingness of Jesus. The willingness of Jesus to help. The willingness of Jesus to intervene. The willingness of Jesus to share his love and to heal and to help. And if the question today is, God, I need help and I'm struggling with sin or shame or hardship, will you help me? The answer from Jesus to the leper and to you today is yes. I will. Could you imagine 
the joy and the picture that would then be when Jesus pronounces you clean. The priest would later confirm this reality, but I picture what it, what it would look like for the leper to go home. The leper to be with his family again. The leper to be in society again. No longer outcast or shamed or forgotten. No longer living with death forever over them. But to go home. And Jesus wasn't just doing these random miracles. He was continually proclaiming that he is the Messiah who has authority and power over everything. One of the interesting concepts too about Jesus touching and cleansing this leper. Jesus didn't become dirty by touching the leper. The leper instead was made clean. That doesn't happen for any of us. I have a three-year-old or two-year-old. He's going to be three next month. I just jump his age already. A two-year-old who, it's amazing when he eats a sucker. If you want to ever passive-aggressively get back at me for anything, just give, one of my, give him a sucker, right? It's just everywhere. You're pulling it off the pants. You're, it's in between the fingers. And often, I've went down and to hold my child's sticky little hand, and I find the, the stickiness, the residue is on my hands. What has never happened is I went to clean my kid's face or hands or went to just touch him. He never becomes clean by my touch. I always become sticky by his. My parents are uh, in town and they're taking them to get to like IHOP or something afterwards to get pancakes. So there will be syrup, you know. Just that's, that's their thing. They can deal with that. We don't, yeah, we don't eat syrup when I'm making dinner or whatever. But, but Jesus does not become dirty. He is, the leper becomes clean. This is what happens when Jesus intervenes and acts in your life. He doesn't become defiled by your sin. You become clean through his holiness, through his being other and separate and distinct from anybody who has ever lived. And so Jesus cleans the leper. And then Jesus charged him. He says, don't tell anyone. And that's always an intriguing thing, right? Why did Jesus say don't tell anyone? Now maybe Jesus wanted him to become or be silent until he was officially declared clean by the priest. Seems like Jesus most likely was trying to prevent excessive excitement over his healing ministry. We'll see, it's, he struggles to move around, to go to different places. You're, you're going to see in the next passage, I keep alluding to it, but they're going to have to tear off the roof just to get people in down to see him because there's so many. But he says, don't tell anyone. He said he charged him, verse 14, to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest. And make an offering for your cleansing. So the two things that would need to happen when you have been cleansed of leprosy or your leprosy is gone (coughs) is you'd have to show yourself to the priest to be pronounced clean and the priest would have to sacrifice, make an atonement for your sins. But here's what's interesting is even the most effective priest, the best high priest, best priest who's ever lived, All they could do was declare a reality. You're clean or you're unclean. They could only observe and declare what they see. Jesus could declare a new reality. He could make something happen with his words. So the priest would proclaim, "Uh, you look clean, you're clean. Jesus says, you look dirty, but you will be clean. He's a great high priest. He's a better high priest. You know, this is the reality of why Jesus came. He came to cleanse. He came to seek and to save the lost. Towards the end of this passage in in, uh, verses 15 and 16, you start to see this tension ramping up. 
This is kind of a turning point a little bit in Luke, but it says in verse 15, but now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered together to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. Verse 16 is so interesting. But he, Jesus, would withdraw to desolate places and pray. In the midst of all the excitement and the the hubbub surrounding Jesus and his miracle working, he withdrew for communion with the Father. He withdrew to pray to God. There's a lesson in there for us as well. A couple of quick applications and we'll be done. Here's the first one. Are you like this leper today? Right? Are, are, are you unclean, burdened down by sin, seeking to manufacture your own righteousness and, and you've yet to just call on to Jesus for help? Right? There is no amount of works or things that you can fabricate or put together to, to create your own righteousness. You cannot do it. The law, the Ten Commandments, it, all it does is point out your own failures. You must see yourself as the leper and cry out to Jesus for help. Perhaps you're a Christian and you would say, I've, I've done that, but I'm still struggling with sin. I'm still struggling with, with pain and struggles in these various areas, whatever they may, may be. The application for you is actually the same. Run to Jesus, desperate need, looking for help, hope, and freedom. Because it can come only from God. Throw yourself down before the Savior. Cry out to him for cleansing and he will help you. You know, that's that's not just a one-time thing where we go to Jesus and, and ask him for help. It's a daily thing. Jesus doesn't just want you to one time acknowledge your need for him. He wants you to daily acknowledge your need for him. The principle here is that he is willing He is willing. Why would we go at it alone when Jesus is willing? Makes no sense. Here's another question or application. Who do you view as unclean? You know, the the religious leaders and many people, they would view, view sinners, view lepers as unclean and they would scatter and separate. But Jesus, we see him moving towards the unclean. We'll continue to see that in Luke 5. As Christians, we're called to be ambassador of Christ. We have the privilege of representing Christ on this earth. Jesus, throughout his time on earth, he loved the unlovely, the sinners, the broken, the needy. He loved them and he cared for the outcast. You should too. You know, the Pharisees, they saw themselves as too good for the unlovely. God, I thank you. I'm not like this publican over here. Jesus ate with the publican. He rescued the publican. He helped them. You serve a God. Here's the third application. Well, let me ask this. Who do you view as unclean? Principle is, Jesus is willing, but are you? Jesus is willing that, right, that we would reach out and connect and help those who are needy. Are you willing? Do you have a a higher bar than Jesus? Or are you willing to minister to who Jesus calls us to minister to? The third application. You serve a God who saves the sinner, loves the lowly, and cleanses the sick. We expect God to be powerful, right? He's the creator. We, he made the world. He formed humans. He holds it all together. We expect that from God. Can you believe what a glorious reality that he is not just powerful? He is good. He is kind. He is loving. This is the God you serve. God is kind. And we, we can't grow cold to this reality. We can't just brush over the reality that God is kind and gentle and loving towards those who have made themselves his enemy. 
right? That's where we stood. We stood as enemies with God. He would have been right to reject us, to punish us eternally. He would have been just to do so. But God is kind. No matter how old you are, you get, I get, you should never lose sight of the beauty of that reality. Jesus is willing. God is kind. Thankful he healed a leper like us. Ken Wyatt, 